Are we on Half schedule? Past one. All right, fine. They've got to take long to get from here to there. Exactly. Causing offence when you don't mean to is annoying. It's not just the person who's been offended, it's the poor chump who's put their foot in it. it spoils their day, too. Hi, could we get a Marsham Street, please? Thanks. Get someone's name wrong. Thanks. Offer your seat to an older person who resents it because they still think of themselves as 26. And high on the list is being stuck in traffic on the way to lunch with people you've never met before. Particularly when you've invited them to lunch. Have you texted them both? I text them both. Go for a, a major text. Charm offensive. The point of this lunch was to talk about civility, well-mannered public behaviour, what it means to be a civilised person. We'd invited an MP so we can talk about politicians and whether they make us more civil. Jeremy Corbyn thinks they should at least set an example. And we'd invited a cultural attaché because diplomats are very civil. And the MP is German and the attaché is Chilean so we can talk about Britishness. Perfect. It was going to be a great lunch. But we were supposed to be there and we were stuck, very stuck in horrible traffic. Rude hooting. Hello, um, uh, we've got a table booked for, uh, I think, half past one today in the name of Chris Ledyard. Um, just for to say, we're on our way, we're just running slightly late, but our guests might have arrived. Oh, right, terrific. Well, um, d do reassure them we'll be there as soon as we can. We're just stuck in traffic. Thanks, see you shortly. Bye-bye. They're there. Oh, fuck it. This is what people who make programmes call Jeopardy. Normally it's contrived. In this case it wasn't. Anyway, let's make the most of it. Will we get to the lunch or won't we? Will our busy guests hang on? Do you care? Meanwhile, we have other people to talk to about civility, including a Welsh tattooist and Tony Blair's former head of policy. But first, a vicar. Hello. Hello, hi. I'm Kate, nice to David. meet you. David, nice right. to meet you. The Reverend Kate Botley is vicar of Blythe, Scrooby and Ranskill in North Nottinghamshire. She's also known as the Gogglebox Vicar because she appears in a Channel 4 programme of that name. If civility is to do with appropriate conduct, being nice to strangers, choosing the right words and never letting the boss down in public, then vicars are surely on the front line. And they wear a uniform. I had a gentleman at um, a church fete the other day who, uh, who nipped my bottom and, and he did it for a bet because his mates went, go and nip the vicar's bottom. And they were like grown men. They just thought this was the height of naughtiness and rudeness that's, was to go and nip the vicar's bottom. See, that's fascinating. There's something ancient in that, isn't there? Because you sort of feel that is, on one level, that is a respect for your office. Yeah, yeah. They sort of realise that is a mighty transgression for them. Something of the Viking because actually, burning down a yeah, church. Yeah, because actually in, what we want from vicars is we want both and, don't we? So we yeah. want them to be cool and trendy and with it, but we also want them to be traditional and reserved. We want them to be warm and friendly, but we want them to be cold and aloof. And you end up just being really nice to everybody. You know, I eat a lot of cake I don't like that I have to <laughs> pretend was delicious. A lot of bad tea, a lot of awful coffee. Being a, a vicar for the Church of England, yeah, yeah. you're right at the heart of the sort of ancient repressed <laughs> Britishness, I, it strikes me. And what you're talking about, eating horrible cake, standing awkwardly, having a yeah. cup of tea, that's, a, that's I I think at the core of what everyone feels about manners, that, that manners can sometimes make us in perpetual denial of our actual feelings. Yeah. It's a minefield for me. I misjudge it all the time. So I was recently at the first ordination of a woman bishop. So I was completely overexcited, absolutely giddy, like nobody's business. And there was a whole load of bishops. And I misjudge completely the ones that I should be excited about and the ones that I shouldn't. So I'm quite a huggy person. I'm quite a touchy-feely person. I have to bishop. rein it in. Well, you, I did. You, you hugged bishops. Oh, I know. And I hugged one, and it was great. And he, yeah. it was, he it was, was more of the bishop of Manchester, bishop. great cuddly bishop. He doesn't wear, he wears sandals the whole time, doesn't wear socks so um that I was, would make me less likely know, to cuddle him to I be kinda, honest i, I kind of went in for the yeah. hug and that was great and then i went in for the second hug of the next bishop that came along who yeah. should remain nameless and he actually held me arm's length he actually he actually leant in and pushed me away and i didn't judge it because i was too excited <laughs> and i went in again and then I went in again. So I, tried, I know no, and it was starting to get a bit like i was stalking the poor guy <laughs> and he ran away I don't mind hugging people, okay. but I don't need to hug okay. people. I am essentially cold inside, <laughs> but I just need <laughs> to know what's eyes. expected. Right, that's right. that's the thing that I that I find like is like a minefield. And um, but no one's no safe one knows now. No one the rules anymore. No. There's the manly pat thing. I've noticed that yeah. sometimes men go in for hugs and do the manly pat thing. I do that. Uh, that's, but do I'm not sure pat? when I've not done a hug and I feel I should have done a after a handshake attempt to sort of awkward shoulder pat. And then do you torture yourself for a little while after? 
afterwards about whether you misjudged yeah. it or not. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then too. I realised, oh, I've gone a bit quiet at the beginning of this conversation because I'm still mortified by how the greeting went. And I think about it in fact, when I'm going to a social occasion where there'll be people I have met a few times before but don't know well, I think yeah. about is there going to be hugging, is there going to be cheek kissing and am I going to seem either weirdly over tactile or sort of weirdly repressed and yeah. hating well, I, of other I, humans. I professionally go to social occasions, so weddings, yeah. christenings, funerals, you know, those are kind of my places that I turn out. And they always seem to put you on the table with very old people. So you end up shouting a lot. So then you end up being the shouty vicar in the corner. And you just <laughs> you, you just think, I just need to drink my drink, eat my food and get out of here as quickly as possible. And if you misjudge it, what happens is you end up having too much drink and then end up on the dance floor and people just don't know what to do then because <laughs> then there's a vicar on the dance floor and that's never good. Yes, so that, that's certainly that's like we have to start a whole new society there's, now. There's etiquette books that haven't even been written on Pe vicars on dance well, floors. Well, people have dealt, I think society has dealt quite rightly with women being vicars. Uh -huh. Dancing vicars, I think that's too far. We've digressed, been led astray by the vicar. The point of this programme is to talk about civility and manners in public places. Though, to be fair, bottom pinching, being nice about bad cake, behaviour towards bishops, they all come firmly under the civility heading. It's uh, down, yeah. It's, Westminster's there. Isn't yeah. It? Let's it's... check in again on the taxi journey. Do you know whether it's going to clear up at all? Yeah, past Trafalgar Square, we well, should be pretty clear. What's well, the past Trafalgar Square, okay, are we? The bottom, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Somebody once said to me that, uh, that I think it's a quite a well known phrase, and that it's, uh, it's very rude to be late because by being late you show that you care more about your own time than you do about anyone else's um, to, <laughs> to which I'm afraid my response was there's nobody alive who doesn't care more about their own time than anybody else's that's you know, the experience of being human it's only your time that you know actually is happening I mean, it's, it is polite to pretend to care about other people's time as much as your own yeah. but if anyone's actually doing it they've got such a deep set collapse of self esteem that they need help I didn't say it in a context where I'd just been late. No. I'm not going to try that now. The thing about the rudeness of being late is that when you're being rude, you're not actually there, so you don't have to see the reaction. By the time you get there, you've finished being rude. Meanwhile, next on our civility list, Jeff Mulgan. Morning. Hi. Hello. 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 I'm Jeff. David. Hi. Jeff runs an innovation charity called Nesta, and in a previous job, he was head of policy in Tony Blair's government. He was there when the respect agenda was in full flow. Do you remember that? Asbo? Yes, that brought it back. It was the last Labour government's big push on manners. Jeff said that their research told them that people were really bothered about public civility and about manners in public places, but the police weren't really interested. They wanted to do the sexier stuff, running around like the professionals, diving in and out of cars. So Jeff and his colleagues invented the police community support officers, and they're still with us. Anyway, Jeff has continued to study what civility means. A few years ago, I was involved in some research looking at patterns of civility in different communities around Britain. And what was quite surprising was some of the places you might have thought people would be nastiest to each other, you know, very inner city areas with very high turnover of population, seemed to have pretty well established norms of mutual respect. And some of the worst behaviour we saw in semi-rural towns on Friday nights where people behaved appallingly. And also we found often it was relatively affluent middle-aged men in particular who behaved incredibly badly uh, around road rage and air rage and fueled by alcohol and they were probably the people who were most likely to say in answer to a survey that standards of behavior had had collapsed in the previous generation and weren't the young appalling and the country was going to the dogs and they saw no connection between their own behavior to others which they thought was entirely reasonable to be incredibly angry when they were say stuck in a traffic jam or whatever and this wider issue of, of, of moral standards. And I think one thing I guess a healthy society does is at least force people to think about how their own behaviour looks to others. Maybe that's the deeper essence of civility. It's not just abiding by politeness and rules, but it's having enough empathy with the strangers around you to realise how your own behaviour affects them. Because the key is that it has to work with strangers, doesn't it? And that's, for me, why I think there's a potential problem when very different conventions of manners develop in different groups, when you have, you know, to exaggerate it, you have your liberal, politically correct group trying to interact with your old school, put a tie on in the golf club 
group mm -hmm. that it's possible to be very rude to a close friend and it's fine but it's how you treat a stranger how you signal to a stranger that you don't mean to cause trouble and this can all be a nice interaction that's the practical front line of manners it's fascinating to look at those cities around the world which have very very diverse populations so there are parts of, of London like Tottenham or or Marseille in France or Toronto in Canada where you have literally hundreds of different ethnicities in quite small spaces living together and having to negotiate new norms of mutual respect and getting on with strangers and quickly you get to some very small things like is it acceptable to spit on the street mm -hmm. uh, is it okay to have a very loud whizzing cry at you know three in the morning waking everyone else up and these things turn out to be negotiated and what's surprising is that most of those places bar the occasional right actually get on pretty well mm -hmm. and they get on better than those places where you just have two or three communities with very clear boundary lines between the communities uh, and often therefore more of a sort of dynamic of mutual hostility and defining norms against each other. What interests me about that is that fundamentally I think as humans we're fearful and suspicious creatures and we do prejudge each other and we're, if we're brought up as Christian or atheist or Muslim or mm -hmm. as rural mm -hmm. Welsh mm -hmm. farmer or an urban family of lawyers or whatever it is we will think of other groups as being not quite like us and we will both think less of them unconsciously and assume that they think less of us mm. that that's the knee-jerk response and manners seems to be a way that we initially conceal that in interaction but it also seems to be something that over time because it lubricates interaction yeah. it then turns to real respect and broad-mindedness yeah. I think humans are incredibly well designed to spot if their environment is essentially benign or hostile. And there are very good reasons for that. For most of human history and prehistory, encountering strangers was a very dangerous experience. They were highly likely to murder you yeah. or to steal your cows or to take your, you know, your wife. Uh, and so we've learned to read from people's reactions to us whether we're likely to survive or thrive in a place. Yeah. And if you walk around a community and people are smiling and are friendly, you basically feel you belong. If they're hostile and you're likely to be mugged, then obviously you feel stressed. You feel, yeah. un and that's why that's one of the basic reasons why civility matters so much. Capitalism is an important part of this story. Yeah. In the Middle Ages, to do trade, you had to rely on very close kinship networks or networks of co-religionists who would lend you credit for your ships to you know, ply around the Mediterranean or so on. And almost with each century, the world has learned to, to orchestrate cooperation at ever larger scales. Yeah. And civility and mutual respect has been absolutely critical to making that happen. There's a concept called civil inattention, which was coined by Irving Goffman. It's the conscious ignoring of people that is crucial to the functioning of cities. We're aware of each other, but we avoid eye contact. We allow everyone their personal space. Thank you. Thanks. Let's get back to the taxi. We've kept up this jeopardy long enough. We arrived half an hour late. Hello. Uh, hello. I'm very, very sorry. We got terribly... Very nice to meet you. This is Christian Leon. He's cultural attaché at the Chilean embassy. We're struck by the irony that we're making a programme about manners and we're incredibly rudely late, and I'm so sorry about that. And my other guest was Gisela Stewart, the Labour MP for Birmingham Edgbaston. Hello. Very nice to meet you. I'm David. Uh, shall I go round to there, then? Gisela and Christian had already ordered, so it's that scanner menu in a hurry moment. Uh, can I have the calamari to start with, please? And then, um, oh, wow. sorry, I mustn't get confused. I have the tagliatelle as well then. Tagliatelle. Thank you very much. Sod manners, I don't want to get the wrong lunch. Actually, no, I'm going to change my mind. Can I have the pappardelle with wild boar? Would anybody like a glass of wine? Uh, oh, yes, come on. I, I will if everyone yeah. else is. <laughs> I will if everyone else does. Yes, the reasoning of the lynch mob. Anyway, cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Clinking glasses, which I believe is like the handshaking, was originally to so that a little bit of liquid would swap, so that you're. You that's can, how you see in the deal. You can, you can tell that no one's poisoning anyone. Yeah. Yeah. What was your perception of Britain and British manners before you came to Britain? Oh, it's the old-fashioned way. Now, we used to watch this program on television, upstairs, downstairs. All right, yes. Uh, and for us, uh, 
British people were like that. So yeah, we thought that you were a very sort of a stratified society and very polite, very reserved. And when I came here, I was quite surprised. It was a completely different uh, um, setup. Mm. But yeah, I think that that's the image we have in Chile, and we still have in Chile about the British people. I mean, very polite, very reserved. We tend to say things like uh, British punctuality, <laughs> <laughs> which, <laughs> yes, is, which very, is not really. Uh, very yeah. sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you have that image, and it's impossible. You are never going to change it. When you were in Germany, sort of viewing 1970s Britain, did you did you think it would be like that? No, but you see, for us, this was liberating. This was, you know, the, the, the end of the Rolling Stones, Fleetwood Mac, you know. Of my, course, my, right. Yeah. It was opening. It was great. Carnaby Street, you know, this was... Why do you think that kind of sense of 60s liberation arose in a country with such a reputation for a stratified society and very rigid rules of manners. Do you think we were, we were so rigid, so there were so many rules, that we had to break out of them first? Or you could be creative within the rules rather than spending your energy on breaking down the rules. Manners and rules are a mechanism by which you channel energy. And I think what the Brits have always been amazing at is that they have managed to deal with conflict in a creative way. But the problem comes that judgmental minefield comes when there isn't that consistency and the only thing that's consistent is whatever the higher up say goes goes and that and that's how they defend their social position but from my point of view the, the whole point of politics is that you always challenge vested interest and you let the outsiders in and i think manners also play a role in challenging the status quo and if the rules of the game are clear to everyone, mm. you allow everybody to have a go at those, mm. challenging it. Yeah. Whereas if yeah. they don't, you, you're narrowing it. When I yes, first I came see. Into so, the a, so everyone knowing the rules gives a chance for social mobility. It does. And only some people knowing the rules is a barrier to that. And when I first came in in 97, uh, we had a record number of women MPs, 121, more than in the entire history of Parliament. And we wanted a crash, and the House of Commons had a shooting gallery, but no crash. <laughs> so I was about to go into the Today program uh, with Alan Clark, of all people, right. to defend this decision that, that where the shoot where the shooting gallery is should be a crash. So I thought before going, I said I better go and have a look at this. So I went down, and this guy who was running the the shooting club showed me the gallery, and I said. Good Marxist principle, you know, if you don't like an institution, join it and infiltrate it and <laughs> destroy it from inside. Yeah. So I said, so what are the rules of joining the shooting club? Yeah. And he looked at me and he said, I can't tell you the rules, because if you knew them, you'd be able to subvert them. <laughs> <laughs> I think rules, people tend to perceive as of, of, of clear rules as being inhibiting. Actually, that can be incredibly enabling. And that's when he comes back when you mentioned yeah. the, the respect agenda by Blair. Mm. That actually was an enabling. That yes, was I not see. something to keep people out. It actually was an enormous enabler. So everybody knows what, what is expected. And then if you want to challenge it, you know what it is you're challenging. Mm. Yeah. And that's the most eloquent defense of the, the ASBO I've ever heard, I must say. <laughs> but still, I don't think people like the state telling them what's social and antisocial. That was what always irritated me about antisocial behaviour orders, that the government should be in the business of deciding what's legal and illegal, not what's social or antisocial. Hello. Hello, would you be happy to talk to us? Yeah, yeah by all hi, means, I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. David. Uh, Meet nice Owen show. and Michelle. Hi. Owen, how are you? Nice Police you. community support yeah, officers in We're Newport making, uh, Indoor Market. We, we tend to find how we speak to people is how they sort of react back to us, but especially as you can imagine, maybe Friday, Saturday nights, Sometimes it can come across quite aggressive, and we're expected sometimes to take it really and truthfully, doing yeah. the jobs that we do. Like you know, do, do you think there's a bit of swagger there that the younger people in front of their friends they don't want to be seen to count out to authority? They want yeah, to show quite their... possibly. Yeah, it's like um, it's like a bravado kind of thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's a, it's a group culture, isn't it? It's like I want to be the alpha male. I want to be this. I want to be that. I've been brought up from a military background. My dad served in the army. My mum served in the army. So I've always had that uh, uniform. Respects, you know, fire service, ambulance, any, anything like that. But there's that culture at the moment where there is no respect for any form of uniform, for want of a better why word. Do you, why do you think that is? 
it's hard for us to put our finger on. Yeah. You know, we're, we're only there to try and help people. They don't want our help. The relationship between uniforms and public behaviour is complicated. In school, children have uniforms and teachers don't. So in that context, the sight of an ununiformed person is supposed to make you behave better. Though often it doesn't. After you've left school, the theory is that people with uniforms improve public behaviour and deserve respect. Though again, that's not what Michelle and Owen necessarily find on a Friday night in Newport. And then there's behaviour which is just downright subversive. Uniforms are just costumes, after all and therefore potentially funny. Here's the Reverend Kate Botley. I was once in a bar and I had my dog collar, I was waiting for a friend, and a group of blokes came over and they were sort of nudging each other, you, you talk to her, you talk to her. One of them came over and went, excuse me, love, and I kind of went, what? He went, are you our strippogram? I said, but I'm sorry. And they were on a stag do, these guys, and they were waiting for their strippogram thing, and they presumed I was the world's worst strippogram. <laughs> their look of relief on those guys' faces when they were figured out that I wasn't the person who was there for their stag do. It's, it's, and, it's but the whole, it was the... so sweet of them. They were, they were so <laughs> nervous coming up at twice. But the stag do strippogram thing is another sort of fascinating element of new manners for me. Men go on stag do's who don't, in general, go to strip clubs, yeah, yeah. but they feel that because it's a stag do, they, they ought to. <laughs> that, that's the new convention. That's like having, you know, people who don't really drink having a glass of sherry at Christmas. Yeah. Like, well, seeing as it is a stag do, we should sort of glumly look at someone who's at, at the slightly less frightening end of the sex industry. Isn't and you go, what, why? I would not want to work as a stripper, but if I had to choose between working You'd as a stripper in front of... Thank you. But if I had to choose between stripping in front of people who were really into it and stripping in front of a stag <laughs> do a sort of going through the motions out of duty. <laughs> I would definitely choose the former group. I mean, We're all just being polite here, watching you take your clothes off. It's expecting too much of a, <laughs> of a stripper to sort of get through it while everyone's sort of sitting there politely. And you know, This conversation's taken a turn I wasn't the, expecting. Yeah, and the best man at the end sort of meekly walks up and writes the cheque <laughs> and then they go, Thank you so right, much. and now we're off to Bella Pasta. <laughs> I didn't expect to talk to a vicar about strippograms in this series, but Kate brought it up. And now I feel slightly socially awkward about it all. <laughs> Back in Newport, I carried on my walk around the indoor market. Here's Joanna, who owns the florists. There are an awful lot of people. They come here and they say, oh, do you know where the toilets are, Lev? I say, oh, the toilets are by there. And they walk away, and I say, oh, thank you. Thank but you they, very they much. They don't acknowledge that no, you've helped them. not even, please, no, thank you. I'm Tony Turner, 76 years of age, and this is my business. I'm a family butcher, and family means a lot. And you've had your family business here for how long? Uh, for 54 years. In the time you've worked here, has the atmosphere changed? Has manners improved or got worse? Manners have seemed to have disappeared. Disappeared? Yes. But, uh, Do you know, even my own grandchildren, they pick up these, these phones and these gadgets, yeah. and they're flicking, I'd say, if you're sitting down with me, put those things away, as it does nothing for you. We need to educate ourselves and realise that, all right, the mobile phone, of course, is very useful in lots of ways, but socially, it's a killer. Yeah. It's an yeah. absolute killer. I'm very disappointed the way we're going. Tony has taken us to an important place, the internet. People may talk about the end of civility in public spaces, but the truth is, in many ways, we've never been safer. That's certainly what Steven Pinker would say, the professor of psychology from Harvard University, that manners have taken us on a journey from a murderous, barbaric civil environment to basically cities that generally function. But the internet is also a public space. And online, we're back with our medieval forebears, throwing chicken bones across the table and sticking the communal soup spoon back in the pot. Shopping in the market, I spoke to Alison, who's a student, and Holly, who's a tattooist. They're both in their early 20s. I think with, with like, obviously, social media, we tend not to have to use manners over social media. The only thing you ever really need to use manners on is an email. And who really sends emails nowadays? It's no, more no, like Facebook the only, messages. It's the only thing I can do. But yeah, <laughs> it's more but, like Facebook messages and texts now. And, of course, on the internet, there's not just, as you say, you don't have to have the manners of normal interaction, yeah. but also there's a lot of rage and rudeness yeah. on the internet. You know, people taking offence and hurling abuse at and each you, other. You Why do you think that you is? Don't, you don't, people wouldn't say it to their faces. Do you think it will c continue to get worse, or is this just a blip while we get used to the new technologies? 
I think it depends a lot on where you were bought it. And this is going to sound really odd, but like I think a cla like your class system has a lot to do with it. Because obviously if you're richer, you tend to have more opportunities to go out and do so stuff. So you're not really addicted to your technology. The same way that like obviously we're not exactly the richest. I'm a student. Holly doesn't work very often. So we're like, oh, okay, you know. So we tend to spend a lot of time on the internet. So we see a lot of this bad stuff that happens. So we're like, oh. So you think people who are more affluent, yeah. there's less ne negative impact on them. Yeah, and because it's all a they do is like, oh, yeah, like we're going to go out, we're going to do this. And you don't tend to post about it on like, your social media, whereas we can easily spend like hours on Facebook or Twitter or just online and we're like, oh, I've got nothing else to do. This is a theory I hadn't heard before, the idea that talking exclusively online is what people with less money have to do, that going out into the real world to interact, that's something you need to be affluent for or at least reasonably well off whereas really poor people end up talking to each other or shouting at each other online, where there are no rules of manners yet established. I think it's mostly like, like the younger generations who are finding that difficult because obviously we're brought up in such an age that we don't need to have that many manners because we do do everything online. Yeah. I mean, so we like we can just send a Facebook message and be like, where are you? Whereas you wouldn't say that to somebody just in yeah, like, yeah. real life, like, oh, OK. And yeah. I think that's what's lost on a lot of people. And we'll pick this up in episode three, the online world and what it's done to conversation and manners. But before I go, some more of the what annoys you most answers. Michelle and Owen, the police community support officers. People who don't smile when you smile at them, yeah. who don't right. smile back. Sneezing, not covering your, not covering <laughs> your right. mouth yeah. when you sneeze. <laughs> and the Reverend Kate Botley. I have a, a, a passionate dislike for noisy eaters and especially um, people on trains eating crisps. And they're always on really early trains and I think, why are you eating cheese and onion at quarter to six in the morning? How are you stomaching that? And I try and say to myself, well, perhaps they've come off a night shift and perhaps they're just really hungry and perhaps this is all OK, but I actually just want to punch them in the face and I'm not allowed to. Yeah. You're not allowed to do that. People don't like it, no, it's especially a, when a you're a vicar. It's a more important it's rule of manners important. than the one about eating quietly. Yeah, it it's is. not punching it, people it, in the face. face. You mustn't do that. There's it's no, not good. no volume no. of eating excuses a face punch. No, it really doesn't. So in tomorrow's programme, we move online. We talk about the death of conversation and I'm going to an assertiveness class, if I can pluck up the courage.